Oh, that's not coffee. <laughs> oh, hello, and welcome to another episode of Denton's Global Politics, where each week I'll be bringing you shot lessons that align directly with the Unit 3 and 4 Global Politics study design to ensure that you have the best chances of success on the final exam and in life. Pcha! This lesson will continue on with Unit 3 Area of Study 1 which focuses on global actors and continue our examination on the state. According to the study design, you need to be able to analyze three challenges to state sovereignty. Number one are regional groupings. Number two are contested and changing borders. And number three are issues that require multilateral resolution. In today's lesson, we'll be looking at the first of these three challenges, regional groupings. Regional groupings, more often called regional organizations, are groupings that states from particular regions form in order to achieve collective goals. Come together right now over me. But you fired me last lesson. I need to eat! Probably the best example of a regional grouping who isn't just a loose collection of states whose main order of business is to come together from time to time and coordinate shirts, I'm looking at you, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, is the European Union which was founded in 1993 in the Dutch city of Maastricht, which far more significantly is also the birthplace of Andre Rue, 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 of Andre Rieu. Oh, well look at that. The European Union was founded in this city. Oh my God. The European Union is probably the most integrated regional group here on the planet. It has its own capital in Brussels. As well as a parliament which passes decisions that EU member states are supposed to implement. Its mascot is also Tintin. Okay, I am lying, but that would be awesome. So, how do regional groupings challenge state sovereignty? Well, when a state joins a regional grouping like the European Union, it is theoretically agreeing to look beyond its own national interests towards the common interests of the region. This may mean that state needs to put in place policies that go against its immediate national interests for the good of the whole. All about the greater good. The greater good. Shut it! It's as if the state is agreeing to share its sovereignty with the whole region. In return, that state gets benefits from being part of a group such as free trade, collective defense, and better integration of infrastructure, transport, and people movement. For example, if you're a citizen of one of the states in the European Union, you get a passport which allows you to travel throughout the whole European Union without worrying about pesky things like borders. Which means countries like France can only stand by helplessly as all these British and Spaniards pour through it, saying, Bleh, I don't understand why all these British people can come here and eat a cordon bleu and drink a champagne and eat a cheese. Stay out! Stay out! You're not welcome here! So, what's an example of one way a regional grouping like the European Union can impact the sovereignty of its member states? Well, for example, members of the European Union have agreed to something called the Common Fisheries Policy, which sets quotas for which member states are allowed to catch what amounts of each type of fish. This policy may challenge individual state sovereignty because individual states can no longer just go out and fish as much as they want. Instead, it's trying to make states operate as if the ocean was a shared resource and the fish within it don't belong only to them. Sounds good in theory, but in practice, states often fish well beyond their set quotas or they allow their domestic fishing companies who want to get the most bang for their buck to engage in the practice of discarding where you literally throw tons and tons of fish you've caught back into the ocean. They're dead, by the way, in favor of more valuable catch to make it look like you haven't actually gone over your quota. So as you can see, regional groupings, nice policies aside, bald-faced individual states' national interests still seem to trump the common interest. So, takeaway one. Regional groupings can challenge state sovereignty to a certain extent. In return for membership in a regional grouping, like the EU, states agree to give up some of their sovereign decision-making power to further collective interests of the region. On the other hand, states regularly ignore regional policies in the pursuit of their own immediate national interests. And now we have millions of dead fish floating around in the sea. Aren't humans great? 